Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami So continuing um, with our readings on the winter retreat topic of happiness, uh, coming again, uh, working through um, this section from Buddha Dhamma, uh, Prapuyuto. And I'll be doing some readings from, um, it's this chapter 11, and then section two, formal teachings on happiness, which starts on page 823 of uh, Buddha Dhamma. I'm just going to be doing some, uh, I'm not going to read through the entire section. Uh, there's some repetition and figured kind of wanted to cover a bit of uh, territory. Uh, so honing in on some of the m major aspects of um, this topic uh, in this section. And this will probably <coughs> sound some of it a, a bit familiar um, uh, from last night's teaching from Lung Pa, um, uh, what he, uh, some of what he was saying actually um, was uh, almost exactly what uh, Prabhupada was saying in the section that I was planning today so <laughs> on, de on desire. <laughs> so you must have been reading the wavelengths, <laughs> anticipating. Just bits and pieces. So if you didn't hear it last night, you'll hear it again today. <laughs> or you'll hear it today. <clears throat> yeah, mostly on the uh, topic of desire, different kinds of... <clears throat> what is happiness? Is the name of section 2A. In order to develop happiness, it is important to know the meaning and significance of happiness. In brief, happiness is the fulfillment of one's desires and needs, or simply a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction. Note that this definition is not all-encompassing, but it covers a broad and basic range of meaning. It is a crucial definition because it comprises the happiness that most people are confined to. Most people are not aware of a happiness greater than this. By defining happiness as the fulfillment of desires, it is also important to understand the nature of desire. The subject of desire is vast. Note here that the Buddha's principal tenet, all things are rooted in desire. This means that all things human beings are engaged with are based on desire, have their origin in desire. <clears throat> Having provided a rough outline of the distinction between the two kinds of desire, he goes into a section here where he talks about uh, craving versus desire, uh, uh, which is you know, a couple of pages, and then he again summarizes exactly what he had just said, so I'm providing the summary here. Having provided a rough outline of the distinction between the two kinds of desire, let us now focus on some of their essential characteristics. Craving, tanha. Desire catering to selfish needs, for example, a wish to acquire something for oneself the search for self-gratification, the wish to personally consume, obtain, become, or avoid something. Verses two, wholesome enthusiasm, chanda, desire focusing on the inherent nature of the object involved, a search for the wellness, virtue, and completeness of an object. An example is the consideration by certain students who have finished their secondary education to go on and study medicine. Some students want to be doctors in order to get rich and to gain honor and prestige. This is a selfish, unwholesome form of desire. Other students wish to study medicine because they want others to be free from illness, to be healthy, to be free from affliction, to live safely and at ease. This desire aims for the completeness of the conditions at hand, in this case, the health of the nation's people, which is the express purpose of the medical profession. This is a wholesome desire. From a wider perspective, those people with wholesome desire, chanda, 
like to create the causes for prosperity, while those full of craving simply want to enjoy the fruits of prosperity. Those with wholesome desire are creators. Those with craving are consumers. The former experience happen the former experience happiness in creating. The latter experience happiness in consuming. I thought that was a good distinction of uh, those two kinds of craving. Before the mind reaches that peace constituting happiness, one may experience various forms of delight and pleasure. In particular, one may experience piti, delight, rapture, and bliss, which in Pali is often paired with happiness as piti sukha. Discerning these various stages of delight and fulfillment provides a clear understanding of how happiness is equal to peace. Moreover, one realizes the nature and value of such peace. The commentaries provide an example for clarification. A man has traveled a long distance through a barren wilderness. He is soaked in sweat, famished and thirsty. At one point, he meets someone traveling the other way and asks whether there is any drinking water ahead. He is told that not far ahead is a large pond with a wooded grove. When he hears this news, he is exceedingly glad and elated. When he walks further and sees the lotus petals, leaves, and stalks scattered on the path, he is even more delighted. He walks on and sees people with wet clothes and wet hair, and hears the cry of forest chickens and peacocks. And as he approaches the pond and sees the lush woodland grove and the lotuses growing in the clear, clean water, he grows increasingly exultant. Finally, he steps into the water, providing a great sense of refreshment. The exhilaration he felt earlier is replaced by calm. He bathes and drinks to his heart's content, dispelling all anxiety, and he eats the roots and leaves of the lotuses until he is full. He then climbs onto the bank and lies down in the cool shade of the trees, caressed by a gentle breeze, and says to himself, ah, such happiness. Desire, based on craving, is full of agitation, anxiety, and stress because it rests on a foundation of delusion and is fed by the attachment to a sense of self. Desire based on wholesome enthusiasm, however, is naturally accompanied by wisdom, which prevents or corrects these mental afflictions. Note that besides a stilling of desire by the way of gratification, there is also a stilling of desire by way of non-gratification, which is an opposite form of intentional action. At the beginning of spiritual practice, the very awareness of training helps in part to deal with desire. Although to some degree one may be acting against one's will and choosing a path of non-gratification, the benefits of training include a feeling of self-development and a joy in having tested one's strength and resolve. There are additional tools for working with desire. First, to empower wholesome mental qualities. One ensures that wholesome desire, chanda, which longs for knowledge, is stronger than craving, tanha, which longs for indulgence. Such wholesome desire, for instance, prevents one from skipping work in order to go off drinking with one's friends. Or my example that I came up with was it prevents one, a wholesome desire, uh, prevents one from skipping morning puja to sleep, <laughs> in order to sleep in. <laughs> um, second, negative qualities are replaced by positive qualities. For example, Paul covets John's money and wants to steal it, but he considers how difficult it was for John to acquire this money. John has enough problems. Why create more for him? This thought gives rise to compassion, and the craving dries up and is stilled. The unwholesome form of desire, craving, on the other hand, manifests as a lust for the five sense objects in order to achieve gratification by way of consuming things. Craving is the desire for consumption, 
this is de a desire to obtain and to acquire solely for one's own benefit. Here is where a crucial distinction between these two kinds of desire is evident. When craving arises, it is by definition accompanied by a presumed owner, desirer, claimant, or consumer, i.e. by someone who acquires, seizes, and consumes, who wants to get things for the sake of this so-called owner or consumer. This is the birth of a sense of self. I thought that was an important distinction. So far, the discussion on desire has focused on people's work and activities, as well as touching upon the relationship to one's environment. For this discussion to be complete, however, one must also look at wholesome desire in relation to other human beings. As mentioned above, wholesome desire, chanda, is the wish for all things to exist in a state of goodness and completion. This desire extends also to all sentient beings. This well-wishing towards all beings, beginning with one's human companions, is the desire for others to be well, to flourish, to be healthy and strong, and to experience joy and happiness. Interaction with other human beings is a vital part of people's lives. Likewise, wholesome desire in relation to other human beings, and indeed to all beings, holds a special significance in people's lives. This well-wishing, or desire for goodness, in relation to other people and other living creatures, has exceptional attributes distinct from the desire for inanimate things to reach a state of wellness and completion. For this reason, there are several terms used to represent chanda in this context, depending on specific circumstances. Instead of using the term chanda to designate wholesome desire vis-a-vis -vis other human beings, the four following terms are used. Metta, loving kindness. Under normal circumstances, if one has wholesome desire, chanda, a sense of well-wishing, towards other people, one wants them to have a bright complexion, be physically healthy, experience happiness. This is a basic initial form of well-wishing. It, it is a desire focusing on another person or living creature. It is not tied up with personal concerns. Karuna, compassion. If one encounters another person or living creature who was unhealthy, debilitated, anguished, or troubled, or who has fallen on bad times, one wishes for him or her to be free from such suffering, destitution, misery, or illness. Mudita, appreciative joy. If another person prospers, a child grows up to blossom and, th and thrive, Someone is healthy, physically beautiful, attractive, someone reaches some form of true success, etc. One rejoices in his or her accomplishments. Upeka, equanimity. In some circumstances, another person is able to take self-responsibility, or else it is suitable and appropriate for him or her to take such responsibility. In such cases, one should allow him or her to remain independent without interference. For example, two parents may be watching their toddler learn how to walk. Wishing for the child to grow and succeed, they watch from a distance without intruding. They do not get caught up with worry and constantly cradle the child. The desire here for a state of wellness is a desire for people's success, goodness, and rectitude. One wishes for them to be able, for them to abide in uprightness, correctness, and safety for them to exist in truth and righteousness. To enable this, one refrains in these circumstances from interfering. Wholesome desire, chanda, is the catalyst for these four mind states. In other words, wholesome desire expresses itself in these four different contexts. A sense of well-wishing when people abide in a normal state of happiness, metta. A sense of well-wishing when people fall on hard times, a wish for them to be released from suffering and to arrive at a state of well-being, karuna. A sense of well-wishing when people reach success and accomplishment, a wish for them to achieve ever greater prosperity, mudita. 
a sense of well-wishing when people have the opportunity to exercise self-responsibility, a wish for them to abide in integrity, uprightness, security, and righteousness. And I just thought that those were some uh, interesting, I hadn't ever actually thought of uh, the four Brahma Viharas as a, um, an expression of chanda. The, it really makes sense the way Prabhupada says that, that, uh, that these are uh, senses of um, well-wishing and, and wholesome intention that come from, the, from a desire, from a wholesome desire for other people's well-being. And interesting how he describes Upeka. I hadn't seen that really so much before either as uh, more with this example of um, not interfering with people developing their own skills that brings their own form of happiness. Somebody, uh, rather than trying to just give them what they need, teaching them how to be able to be independent and getting what they need themselves. And that kind of fits into my thoughts or my ideas or understanding of generosity that there's lots of levels of generosity. Um, you know, uh, a very good one, of course, being the giving of something to somebody, giving of gifts, giving of support, material well-being. But that the highest form of giving is um, offering, say, uh, what we can share from our knowledge and experience of the practice of, of the teachings, the Dhamma, um, which then enables people to generate their own uh, well-being rather than us, rather than depending on somebody else. Um, and so that's how he uh, kind of talks about equanimity, in, in other words, stepping back and, and letting people um, develop their own uh, skills and their own abilities, as opposed to the standard definition of, you know, an understanding of, um, you know, cause and effect, although it does overlap with that understanding as well. Most people only consider the first three kinds of well-wishing, but this is insufficient because these three factors are still confined to the domain of feeling. Although these feelings, sentiments, or emotions are exalted and highly cultivated, they are not yet complete. Only the fourth factor, upeka, brings completion. In brief, if people only possess wholesome sentiments, no matter how elevated or sublime these may be, this is inadequate. These sentiments fulfill personal attributes, but they not, are not yet linked with truth, with dhamma. Although these people are good, they may not yet be correct. To realize the truth, to reach true correctness, to dispel suffering, and to realize perfect happiness, one must also possess knowledge. Technically speaking, completing the cultivation of the mind, citta, is insufficient. Factors of the mind or the heart cannot by themselves bring about liberation. One must complete the cultivation of wisdom, panya, which is the decisive factor for liberation and mental perfection. The first three forms of well-being or a well-wishing are confined to factors of the mind, citta. The fourth factor involves wisdom, which promotes true application of the mind and leads to liberation. <coughs> In some, although people may possess positive emotions, they need wisdom to regulate, refine, and evaluate these emotions. The fourth factor of equanimity constitutes this link with wisdom. If people lack wisdom, they are unable to solve life's problems. Even if they are possessed with virtues and wholesome sentiments, they may apply these incorrectly and perform unskillful actions. Say a thief steals $2,000. From one perspective, he has reached success. He has obtained money and experiences some happiness. How should one respond to this? In accord with the factor of appreciative joy, one rejoices in this happiness. Yet this is incorrect. Here, one runs counter to the true Dhamma practice by getting stuck on the level of emotions. Although the emotions are positive, they may lead to trouble. People may then condone stealing, causing all sorts of problems for society. Here is where wisdom brings about an integration and balance of the mind. The wish here, referred to as equanimity, upeka, is for other people to possess rectitude and correctness. 
Equanimity as an expression of wholesome desire, chanda, is the wish for others to be well and complete. In order to reach completion, people must align themselves with dhamma, with righteousness. One abides in a state of equanimity in order to allow correctness and righteousness to proceed according to the laws of nature. The first three factors of kindness, compassion, and appreciative joy protect the individual. The fourth factor of equanimity also safeguards the truth. If someone else commits a breach of truth, then one should uphold and protect the truth, uphold justice and probity. Fulfillment is reached with equanimity, which is an emotion connected to wisdom. Equanimity acts to balance these four divine abidings, Brahma Vihara. According to the Buddhist teachings, these four factors are indeed divine forces. That is, they represent Brahma, the highest divinity, and protect the world. So that's the um, excerpts from that part, uh, section two, formal teachings on happiness. And he, is, he kind of covers a, a broad um, grade of uh, issues, which I think he probably expands on more later on in, the, in this section, in this chapter. Uh, this is sort of the introduction to the various kinds of um, happiness, um, all the way of the ones you know, based on uh, material happiness, uh, and the more unskillful um, gratification based on tanha or craving, and then the more uh, skillful applications based on uh, chanda. Um, and uh, um, he uh, points out in some of the sections that I didn't actually go uh, into as much detail reading, um, but as uh, Lumpa was referring to last night, um, that... Um, you know, the, the, the tanha, the craving that's based on wanting to uh, indulge in something or to be the consumer, as Prabhupada says, uh, to be the consumer of experience, um, is actually a comfortable, uncomfortable, and agitating state of being. Um, and I heard it once explained that desire or tanha actually has um, at its root the wish to lead to its own demise. Um, because it is uncomfortable. We think of it as a wish or a craving to, uh, to, to get something, and it is. But it's based on this sense of discomfort, agitation, um, and that the only way we know how to get rid of that discomfort or agitation is to get the object that we think is going to fulfill our, our wishes. And as, again, as Uncle was pointing out last night, it, there is a gratification that comes with satisfying craving or tanha. The problem being is that there's also the downside, which is it's transitory and permanent, and, and, and it, there's no end to it. It just finds another object once, uh, once it's been partially satisfied, and then that wears off. So it's really actually better to cultivate the kind of desire, chanda, that leads to the state where tanha doesn't even have to arise, um, because... Um, we are finding fulfillment in things that are um, uh, more stable, more peaceful, and that also lead to and support the path of uh, development of panya, wisdom, um, uh, and then to the relinquishment of uh, all of those um, conditioned forms of, of, of happiness. So that um, uh, if we can uh, you know, direct our forms of uh, gratification to more refined states um, that are part of the path and build a sense of stability uh, and conviction in the path, faith in the path, um, then the tanha doesn't even need to arise. The tanha will start to just, you know, not appear. It's that non-arising aspect of neurota. Um, and then that's, that, that's even more peaceful than having to, to gratify the desire. Uh, and get some temporary relief. It's just better not to have it arise at all. So the development of, of panya um, uh, is the most skillful desire because then it helps us move towards um, relinquishment uh, of all of those things that cause agitation, uh, whether it's 
the desire to get something in the sensual world, the desire to become something, or the desire just to be done with it all in annihilation. Um, so it, we relinquish all of those forms of unskillful desire uh, with the development of, of panya. And um, yeah, that just it was interesting. He kind of did a little bit of skipping around here. There was that brief section in the middle where he talked about um, uh, piti and sukha uh, and gave the example from the commentaries. Um, oftentimes you see that mostly in relation to developing um, the mind, the citta, the, uh, the um, uh, benefits of, of absorption, concentration, um, but that that is also... Um, um, a skillful form of chanda, uh, but again itself is not complete, as he was pointing, as Prabhupada was pointing out, the development of the mind, um, uh, the development of citta is often referred to like um, liberation, temporary liberation, citta vimuti, um, the liberation that comes, the temporary liberation that comes from development of um, sublime states in, in absorption. Um, but that the, uh, uh, the, the true fulfillment of the path is uh, the development of, of wisdom, uh, panya, vimuti, freedom from, uh, freedom from suffering uh, based on uh, wisdom or discernment. So that's a few thoughts from, uh, from this section. Any comments or questions or anything like that, discussion? Yeah, I skipped a fair amount of, of his discussion on that because, yeah, it, that's a good point. I, I guess I was sort of assuming that people were pretty much up on that. And he points that out. He, he, he basically uh, you know, says just that, that chanda is a broader term, um, and say as in kama chanda, um, it has an unwholesome quality to it. Um, but that he says for the sake of ease of use in pointing out the differences, he is just assuming to use the word chanda for wholesome uh, desire, and that that uh, actually kama chanda um, falls more into the category of of tanha as a form. There's actually some other words and terms and usages, particularly from the commentaries, that are pulled into as well as uh, chanda and, and tanha. But that is an important distinction because you do see kama chanda as the basic example of unwholesome desire. But then there's say like Dhamma Chanda, which is the wholesome desire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, someone's desire for a hygiene standard is that considered a desire or wholesome? For a what standard? Hygiene standard. Hygiene, like cleanliness. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, I, I think it, for sure it can be. Like we we have a, a, a hygiene standard here of. Uh, Wanting a neat and tidy monastery, you know, we like we like things clean and and uh, tidy. I think if it becomes um, an obsession, yeah. you know, uh, which sometimes things like that can be, you know, a skillful uh, a skillful thing can turn unskillful if it's picked up and held uh, with a like a negative or a critical state of mind or a compulsive state of mind. Um, then that forms into sort of an unhealthy form of, of desire. Uh, but if it's a desire based on an aspiration for things to be fresh and clean and suitable for, for, for human beings to be around, um, that can apply to anything, not just hygiene. You know, We can use skillful objects or skillful mind states uh, in either skillful ways or unskillful ways, depending on the motivation. So if it leads to irritation and aversion because somebody isn't keeping things clean and tidy or isn't taking a shower when they should, then uh, 
then you know if it gives rise to aversion in your mind, then then that's an unskillful way of upholding it. I like the perspective on the four Brahma Viharas, mm. the author uh, Panic Sass expounded on. Yeah, yeah, as a form of, of chanda, a form of wholesome desire. Yeah, I thought that was a very skillful application of that of that term too. Probably the, you know, one of the highest forms that one can experience wholesome desire in the in the human realm, especially as it moves towards the development of of, of wisdom, panya. I have a question for Lumpur based on Ajahn Tidapano's reading last week um, about the five hindrances. And uh, I wonder if you could speak on the distinction between the hindrance of agitation, guilt, and remorse, specifically the remorse aspect, how that's different from the remorse of Ephiriyotipa. <coughs> well, I mean, the thing is, is <coughs> when you have uh, something like here in Otapa. And this is why the Buddha is really good at uh, he's re- he's quite quite skillful in his, and specific in his in his definitions because um, you know one leads to a kusala state of mind and what, and the other leads to akusala. So I mean we have say our shades of meaning in English are, are you know, can be, you've got one word that goes in two different directions, but the Buddha is using uh, hearing and otapa, uh, and, and that has a, that has its root, and that's, that's a, that is a wholesome uh, quality, it's, it's bound up with wholesome states of mind, whereas, uh, say, uh, Utucha kucha kukucha is uh, uh, your, your your remorse, uh, agitation, restlessness, worry. Uh, those are I mean it's 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 a hindrance. It's very it's a nivarna. It's always going to be an unwholesome state of mind. Uh, so that that the Buddha is even if we use the same word in English, it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, so it's more of a translation. So it's like getting back to the root of, of what, uh, <coughs> what the uh, what the Buddha is pointing to, in that one can be have remorse uh, in terms of of uh, uh, and and one tortures oneself with it. One uh, returns to it. One goes back over it. Uh, one. Uh, uh, punishes oneself with it uh, because of whatever obsession we have in the moment. But it's, it, it is rooted in akusala, mental conditions. Whereas hiriyotapa is, uh, is a bright state of mind, wholesome state of mind. It sees the, the it sees the unskillful and is motivated to develop the, uh, uh, the uh, one's path towards dhamma, towards truth, and therefore it's what the Buddha calls protector of the world. Hiri and Otapa are, are they're called protectors of the world. So that's a that's a that's a bright state of mind, wholesome state. One experiences it completely differently. <coughs> Even if the content might appear the same, the feeling is very, very different. Yeah. Do you, f- like my own experience with what I believe to be Hiriyotapa, while I see it as completely crucial and, and helpful, like you're saying, I don't always find it pleasant. You know, if I've said something wrong or done something wrong. <coughs> so, but I'm for yourself, like, is the experience of your yoga, like, like a pleasant, like, feeling, like, gratitude, or... Well, I mean, it can be pleasant, just to sort of be, be, be willing to recognize one's own, one's own failing, and say, wow, I I really missed my shot on that, but then the motivation Mm -hmm. is to improve, or to protect oneself, 
and to protect the puppies. Uh, <clears throat> it almost seems like one of the differences is how one is related to it. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's how one relates to it. One has, a, one has, a, say, a, a positive relationship with, with, uh, with, uh, you know, some particular uh, recognition of of uh, unskillfulness or. Because that's and that's the thing is is these are uh, um, we're we're in a causal process constantly so that the kusala can be a, a condition for increased kusala conditions or it can be for the akusa. It's like the uh, the example <coughs> just now of you know hygiene or keeping things neat and tidy and you get really uh, absolutely obsessed and, and irritated when anything is out of, out of place. Uh, I have no idea what that's like, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take your word for it. <laughs> so it's, it's a, uh, so you can see that so the kusla is a condition for the, the, the akusla. And similarly, with the akusala being a condition for increased kusala, but it can also be a condition for kusala because of the, the recollection or, or the motivation that arises when one sees, oh, this is not skillful, this is not to my benefit, it's not to the benefit of others. And then that, that is a cause for, for uplift and, and, uh, and, and determination in a skillful way. <coughs> Yeah, it seems very much like, say, one says something that one feels bad about. Yeah. Like, a, like you, we could frame it as a mature or an immature response to that. Yeah. Going one of these two ways. Yeah. 